There was a section in Yankee Stadium, the old one cobbled together in the 20s out of plywood and spit, that had earned a reputation over the course of 85 years as being nearly impossible to reach. Deep in the left field corner, three decks up, it was a part of the ballpark that had seldom been visited by a batted ball, save for three instances. The first visit took place on August 11, 1935. With the Philadelphia Athletics in town, Yankees ace Lefty Gomez took the mound against first baseman Jimmy Fox. Fox, who by this point in his career had already established himself as one of, if not the, most powerful first baseman to ever play the game, promptly deposited the OO pitch into the left field grandstands, shattering a seat and leaving spectators in awe. Later on, Gomez was asked just how far the home run had gone. I don't know, he replied, but it took somebody 45 minutes to go up there and get it back. The second time a baseball made its way to that part of the park would be during Game 4 of the 1963 World Series. With Whitey Ford on the mound, Dodgers right fielder Frank Howard stepped to the plate. Howard, whose raw power had once been compared to the likes of Babe Ruth, had already crushed a 450-foot double off of Ford in Game 1, the longest such hit in Yankee Stadium history. This time around, he demolished yet another of Ford's offerings, sending it deep into the corner of the stadium. It would be 17 years before another baseball was hit to that part of the park, but this time, the man responsible wasn't a future Hall of Famer or a once-in-a-generation power bat. It was a little-known outfielder from California named Joe Charbonneau. Santa Clara, California is a city of about 100,000, nestled between San Jose and the San Francisco Bay. Established by Spanish missionaries in 1777, these days you'll find the heart of Silicon Valley, dominated by companies like Intel and Applied Materials. But contained within that 250-year interim was the childhood of a boy who, though little more than a footnote in his hometown's history, would go on to capture the heart of an entire city. The fifth of seven children, Joseph Charbonneau was born on a farm outside of Belvedere, Illinois in 1955. It was at six years old that Joe's father Art moved both him and his mother across the country to Santa Clara. His parents separated a year later, plunging Joe and his family into near poverty. As his mother worked tirelessly to keep their heads above water, Joe was mostly left to his own devices. He would get in fights around the neighborhood, which usually resulted in frequent visits to the hospital where his mother worked. He was expelled from school in the seventh grade due to poor grades. But what was also clear from a young age was that for all his academic and social struggles, Joe was actually pretty bright. Joe had concentration problems, his mother would later say. He is an intelligent person with an above average IQ. I talked to a lot of his teachers and they said he could not sit still. Joe is a very physical person and he has so much energy. He can't stay in one place for very long. In today's world, it's likely that young Joe Charbonneau would have been referred to a specialist to help him deal with his obstacles to learning. But in the 1970s, the solution for Kathleen Charbonneau was to send Joe to live with his father up in Portland, Oregon. Under the stern eye of his father, Joe was able to get his life back on track. He started playing baseball again, and his brother introduced him to weightlifting. By the time he returned to Santa Clara a year later, it was like he was a whole new person. But it didn't take long for Joe to slip back into trouble. He was declared academically ineligible to play baseball as a sophomore in high school, once again losing one of the few sources of stability in his life. It was also around this time that the first entries in the legend of Super Joe were being written. See, when he wasn't playing baseball, Joe was forced to find other outlets for his energy. Never one to back away from a challenge, he would take part in bare knuckle boxing matches for money, swallow whole eggs, and drink beer through his nose. There was nothing he wouldn't do, no risk he wouldn't take. But eventually he did make it back onto the baseball field. However, despite his ability, he was far from a top prospect. In fact, when Philly scout Eddie Bachman made his way to his high school, it wasn't to see Charbonneau at all, but his teammate and future Atlanta Falcons quarterback, Steve Bartkowski. Obviously, Bartkowski, the major leaguer, didn't pan out, but Eddie Bachman left Santa Clara with a new prospect in his sights, a diamond in the rough named Joe Charbonneau. After high school, Charbonneau enrolled at West Valley College in Saratoga, California. He majored in park management with the plan to become a park ranger when he was finished with baseball. 
However, after his first season at West Valley, it was clear that he wouldn't be finished with baseball for quite some time. He hit 373 and led the conference with 12 home runs during the 1975 season, earning himself a selection by the Minnesota Twins in the sixth round of the 1976 amateur draft. He declined the offer, opting instead to return to West Valley for his sophomore season. Once again, he dominated at the plate, enough to be selected in the second round by Bachman's Phillies. On June 10, 1976, he inked a contract with the Phillies that included a $5,000 signing bonus, quite the raise from the cash earned fighting in the streets. Joe Charbonneau was headed to the pros. He was sent almost immediately to Class A Spartanburg, where he finished the season with a 298 average, 4 home runs, and 18 RBI. The Phillies rewarded his promising start with a promotion to the Peninsula Pilots of the Carolina League in 1977. When the season began, Charbonneau was seen as a potential top prospect for Philadelphia, but only a few months later, Joe found himself sporting an ugly 172 average and riding the bench. He asked the Phillies to send him back down to Spartanburg, where he would be able to play on a daily basis, but they refused. So he packed his things and quit. Just like that, it seemed as if Joe Charbonneau's professional career was over before it could even begin. Joe returned to Santa Clara, where he found work as a stock clerk for an electronics company. In his free time, he lifted weights and played softball, and things probably would have stayed that way if not for Eddie Bachman. When the 1977 season was over, Bachman reached out to his former prospect, encouraging him to give baseball one more chance. It took some convincing, but a few months later, Joe Charbonneau found himself suiting up for the Class A Visalia Oaks. In 130 games for Visalia, Charbonneau led the California League with a 350 average, cracked 18 homers, drove in 116 runs, and scored 119. It was a breakout season for Joe, who was once again looking like a promising MLB hopeful. But while his on-field heroics left the Phillies with nothing to complain about, his off-field antics came to be a bit too much for the Philadelphia Brass. That winter, Joe Charbonneau was shipped to Cleveland for pitcher Cardell Camper. Camper would never play another inning in the majors. As for Joe, he settled in nicely with the AA club. He won a second straight batting title in 1979 and led the AA Chattanooga Lookouts with 21 home runs and 78 RBI. Heading into the spring of 1980, it was looking like he might have a real shot at breaking the Major League roster. Despite his performance in the minors, however, most fans in Cleveland still hadn't heard of the young slugger. But when reporter Terry Pluto first laid eyes on the 6'2", 200-pound Charbonneau, he knew the Indians had something special on their hands. I thought I'd found Shoeless Joe from Hannibal, Missouri, Pluto said. You know, Joe Hardy from Damn Yankees. After witnessing some of Joe's signature clubhouse stunts, it was Pluto who first came up with the nickname Super Joe. And when Cleveland outfielder Andre Thornton went down with a knee injury right before the 1980 season was about to begin, Joe Charbonneau was given the chance to show just how super he could be. He started in left field on opening day in Anaheim, in front of a crowd of 37,000, a far cry from the softball fields of Santa Clara that he had been patrolling only three years earlier. In the fifth inning, he stepped to the plate against Angels ace Dave Frost and proceeded to crush a home run to right center field. When fans back home in Cleveland checked the box scores the next morning, it was Joe Charbonneau's name that stood out. Just who was this kid anyway? They got their answer eight days later when Charbonneau dazzled in the Indians' home opener, going three for three with a walk in four plate appearances, including a single, a double, and a home run in the sixth inning off a of veteran reliever Tom Buskey. Something special was about to happen in Cleveland. On June 28, 1980, what was previously just a fascinating side story in an otherwise unexceptional season blossomed into the legend of Super Joe Charbonneau. With lefty Tom Underwood on the mound at Yankee Stadium, Charbonneau came to the plate to lead off the second inning for Cleveland. He then proceeded to launch a fastball into the fabled third deck of the left field grandstands. I remember it like it was yesterday, he recalled years later. As I was going around second base, I looked up to where the ball landed and thought to myself that I'd probably never hit another ball like that again. And I never did. It was a once-in-a-lifetime swing. It was said that Joe Charbonneau's blast that day was one of the three longest home runs ever hit in Yankee Stadium. In one swing, he had done what the likes of Mantle, Gehrig, and Ruth could not, and had etched the first lines of his spot in the history books as well. But for as electrifying as he was on the field, 
His exploits off of it were equally, if not more, responsible for his reputation as the wildest man in baseball. Let's take a moment to list just a few of the legends surrounding the larger-than-life Super Joe. He was said to have fixed his own broken nose himself, using only a pair of pliers and a few shots of Jack Daniels. He once won a bet by eating six entire cigarettes while they were still lit. He was known to open bottles with his eye socket and to drink beer through his nose. He ate objects ranging from shot glasses to light bulbs and pulled his own aching teeth. He dyed his hair long before Dennis Rodman came along, removed one of his own tattoos with a razor blade, and named his daughter Dannon because he liked the yogurt. Oh, and once, while he was in Mexico for an exhibition game, Joe Charbonneau was stabbed in the chest by a fan outside of the team hotel. The knife penetrated four inches and struck one of his ribs. He played in his first regular season game a month later. He was a player unlike any other and the biggest baseball star in Cleveland since Rocky Calavito. But to truly appreciate why Joe Charbonneau was such a perfect fit for Indians fans, you first need to understand something about the city of Cleveland. See, Cleveland isn't like most other major American cities. It doesn't have the towering skyscrapers of New York, or the glistening bay of San Francisco, or the sunny weather of Los Angeles. In truth, it's a pretty difficult city to market. Fun times in Cleveland today! Cleveland! Come on down to Cleveland town, everyone! Come and look at both of our buildings! Buy some food that's prepared near the street! Who knows you might even see this sky! Yeah! But for all it lacked, Cleveland had something those other cities didn't. Cleveland's long-heralded punk scene traces back to the literal codification of rock music in the United States, when Pennsylvania native turned Cleveland disc jockey Alan Freed introduced the local airwaves to some of the rowdier and lesser known areas of rhythm and blues, dubbing it rock and roll. He would go on to host the Moondog Coronation Ball in 1952, which many consider to be the first ever rock show. Unfortunately, it was over before it began, as 25,000 attendants showed up to the 10,000-person capacity Cleveland Arena, forcing the local troops to shut the venue down after only one song. But what a hell of a song it must have been. Cleveland would then experience an awful 25-year period that saw their city's industry abandon them, a couple of river fires due to Cleveland being the most polluted area in North America, culminating in the city going bankrupt in 1978. But where there's friction, there's a spark, which came in the form of punk rock, which took the ethos of Alan Freed's tenacious idealisms and turned them up to 11. The original stone being Rocket from the Tombs, a band whose presence would inspire brawls at their shows before they would even play a single note. While hardly nationally recognized as one of the founders of punk, also known as a proto-punk band, they were inspired by a massively influential group who considered Cleveland as a second home a few years prior. This band is The Velvet Underground, who has directly influenced acts such as R.E.M., David Bowie, U2, and were once described as a band that didn't sell many records, but everyone who bought one went out and started a band themselves, which was a quote attributed to Brian Eno, who was considered to be one of the most influential producers of the 20th century and beyond. The Velvet Underground, whose off-kilter lo-fi sound meant they had trouble attracting any sort of crowd outside of their hometown New York City, were able to make a name for themselves in the Cleveland scene. Would their already limited popularity have been diminished had it not been for the support generated by the Forest City? Anyway, the Velvet Underground inspired Rocket from the Tombs, who would dissolve and form into two camps, the Rockus and Rowdy Dead Boys and the Arty Farty Para Ubu. While not nearly as nationally revered as Lou Reed and the Funky Bunch, they would go on to define the city's sound and put Cleveland on the map as a crowd that was willing to support avant-garde idealisms while still putting up the grit to back it up. This is how bands such as the Pylon Presenting Devo came out of nearby Akron, or how band members from the Superior Misfits gained their inspiration. Because the city supports any idea, no matter how odd, how off the beaten path, 
or how unpopular it may seem. And who knows, said idea could change the world, or it could burn out before making it halfway past Euclid. This is how a player like Joe Charbonneau could come to a prominence in a city like Cleveland, and only a city like Cleveland. A player who isn't afraid to express himself, but in addition has the grit to back it up. In a city like New York, he'd be considered a distraction. In Los Angeles, he would have been seen as a ruffian. San Francisco... Okay, he probably would have fit in with San Fran, but only in Cleveland would the two worlds of punk and Charbonneau so perfectly clash together like a supernova and produce a little-known song that honors both. And with that, I present to you Go Joe Charbonneau by Section 36. that if you play in New York or L.A., you do commercials and you get songs written about you. Well, out Cleveland way, Joe Charbonneau has a song. It's a hit record, and he is a hit in Cleveland. Over 131 games played during the 1980 season, Joe Charbonneau hit to the tune of a 289 average, scoring 76 runs, and leading the team with 87 RBI in the process. His 488 slugging percentage was by far the highest on the club, and placed him among the best in the American League. He also hit 23 home runs, more than twice the total of the next highest on the team. With all that, plus the phenomenon that was Super Joe, the Rookie of the Year award was almost an afterthought. He won easily, beating out his fellow rookies with 73% of the vote. But let's not stop there. Just how does Super Joe Charbonneau's 1980 season stack up against some of the best of all time? I took a look at some other seasons by hard-hitting outfielders in their mid-20s, and found that prior to 1980, the closest approximation to the incredible rookie year of Joe Charbonneau was, drumroll please, Hall of Famer Reggie Jackson's age 24 season in 1970 with the Oakland Athletics. Stacked up against each other, the stat lines of these two seasons look almost identical. Beyond that, however, exists a parallel deeper than even statistics might suggest. It was Reggie who pioneered the role of the volatile media darling, as proficient in generating controversy off the field as he was at generating runs on it. Teammate Daryl Knowles, when asked if he considered Reggie a hot dog, famously replied, there isn't enough mustard in the world to cover Reggie Jackson. In fact, it's not beyond the realm of possibility to suggest that without Reggie Jackson, Super Joe Charbonneau would never even have been possible. This all then raises the question, if Joe Charbonneau was this good, why doesn't he have a plaque in Cooperstown alongside Mr. October? Well, there are a few answers to that question. But the most apparent explanation, as is the case with many young phenoms who ultimately don't pan out, is, of course, injury. Of all the aspects of Joe Charbonneau's career-altering injury, perhaps the most remarkable was how unremarkable it was. 
because when he went down in spring training of 1981, it wasn't from eating cigarettes or performing surgery on himself using household items. No, Joe Charbonneau's decline began on a play the likes of which he had completed dozens of times before. During a preseason game, he dove headfirst into the second base bag, badly hurting his back in the process. From that moment on, every swing he took was through the lingering pain from that day. Determined to stay on the field, he gritted through it, but he never found a swing again. By mid-1981, he was hitting only 210 in 48 games, and his once prodigious power stroke had only mustered four home runs during that time. He was sent down to the International League, where he hit a measly 217 with zero home runs over 17 games in Charleston. He decided to call it quits on the season and went back home to California. As for the Cleveland Indians, they finished the 1981 campaign sixth in the seven-team American League East, only a year after competing for a playoff spot into the last days of the season. They extended a roster invitation to Charbonneau for the 1982 season, but his struggles continued and he was yet again demoted to Charleston after hitting just 214 in 22 MLB games. That year was the last time Joe Charbonneau would set foot on the diamond as a major league ball player. By 1983, he was manning the outfield for the AA Buffalo Bisons of the Eastern League. On Wednesday, May 18th, Charbonneau came to bat in the midst of a 13-6 loss to the Albany A's. Batting 206 with two home runs on the season, he hit a ground ball right back to the pitcher, who threw it to first for the out. Joe, meanwhile, appeared to make little effort to beat out the throw, and the fans let him have it. On his way back to the dugout, with boos raining down on him from all directions, Charbonneau raised his hands toward the crowd in what would later be referred to by more respectable publications as a quote-unquote obscene gesture. He was suspended by the club for a week and subsequently released, bringing a premature end to yet another disappointing season. A year later, Joe Charbonneau, now 29 years old and rounding off a respectable, if not quite spectacular, season with the Pittsburgh Pirates Class A affiliate, would hang up his spikes for good. Over three years spent in Major League Baseball, the man known as Super Joe played in a grand total of 201 games, the fewest by a position player who won the Rookie of the Year award in MLB history. Yet today, Charbonneau remains one of the most beloved Cleveland players of all time, frequently making appearances with the team. Years after he left the show, Charbonneau revealed that despite the media's fixation on the semi-mythical character of Super Joe, he never truly felt comfortable in the spotlight. All that stuff embarrassed me. The nickname, the books, the song, the stories, he said. I just wanted to play ball. I wasn't interested in a lot of publicity. Making it to the big leagues was the highlight for me. Baseball was good back then. The city of Cleveland is no stranger to rock stars, but for one summer in 1980, they were gifted with an experience the likes of which nobody could have expected, and a season no one would soon forget. Was Super Joe Charbonneau a one-hit wonder? Maybe. But then, what's so bad about that? <laughs>